let's move right into our first speaker of the fall. We are so pleased to have with us Travis Plated here, uh, who's the executive director of the Lethbridge Friendship Centre. He's a relative newbie in that position, but has uh, done a number of things in this community, including he's a member of the Board of Governors of the Community College, for example, but has a wide involvement in this community and a leader among his people. He was born uh, 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 on the Blood Reserve and uh, is a Southern Albertan through and through. So without saying too much more, I'm going to let him introduce himself and his topic of uh, Blackfoot culture and how that's uh, been strengthened and maintained over the years. Travis, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nisto wala ko ka akayam sinima kitu na sinima sinipo. So I thought I would introduce myself in my first name, which is Akayam Sinniman, which is translated to many braids. And that was my great-great-grandfather's name. He never had an English name. That was his name. So we were just talking about language here. And the only way you're going to preserve the language, I heard one old guy say, you got to hear it. If you don't hear it, you'll never learn it. So every opportunity I get to say, to speak in my language, I do, because it's very important. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So first of all, I'm very honored to be asked to come and speak. I always wondered when I'm going to get here. <laughs> and mark it off the bucket list now. <laughs> but I always admire the work that you you do, and I've, I've listened to the podcast and we're actually going to be starting a podcast over at the uh, Friendship Center, so I'm in very interested in that thing over there. Anyways, I only have a few minutes here, and we got a very big topic, so I won't um, babble on too long here. I think what I'm going to do, um, I understand after dinner, after lunch, we, you know, there's a answer in uh, Q and A, so you're more than welcome to ask whatever question you want. Like I told the ladies here, I can solve all your problems today, so no worries. We'll take care of it. Uh, but I will stick to the topic of culture and what that means uh, to me, to my community, to our community here in the city of Lethbridge, and where we're at today and where we hope to be in the next few years. So I do have a few slides that I kind of rely on, but um, I'll see how this works here. Oh, the plus the arrows. The arrows? Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So obviously, obviously, um, as mentioned, we are in Blackfoot territory. So what does that mean? Well, for those of you who don't know, there is actually four tribes that make up what is known as the Blackfoot Confederacy. And they are the Blood Tribe, which I'm a member of, the, um, this should, here we go, There's our, these are our modern day flags. So we have the Blood Tribe, where I'm from. Over there is Pikani, which is just over by Pincher Creek. And then we got Sitsikai, which is just east of Calgary, about an hour. And the blue one on the bottom is Amskapiti Kani. They like to be called Blackfeet, and they're in Montana. So these four tribes make up what is known as the Blackfoot Confederacy. And I had the little map up there, the, the green, as you can see. That is what we call the old Blackfoot country, pre-contact. At the time of when the horses arrived, about four or five hundred years ago, this is the territory of my ancestors. So as you can see, it extends. There was no lines back then. It extended all the way down. Today we use like the Yellowstone, the Rockies to the east, oh sorry, west, and the North Saskatchewan, and right down into uh, Saskatchewan. All of that territory is what my ancestors controlled before contact, okay? And that's important. So I found another map. I don't have it on this, uh, this presentation here. But we signed treaties with the United States before we signed treaties with the British, with what we call uh, our grandmother, the Queen. We signed the Bull Treaty in 1854, I believe. 
So we actually signed treaties with the United States government before we signed treaties with the British government. And then, of course, eventually we did sign our treaties in 1877 with the Queen. And these are all the other ones that are signed. There's a total of uh, seven there. And as you can see, we were the last ones to sign. And there's good reason for that. But I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit later. So this is a nice photo of um, what it might have looked like at the uh, signing of the treaty. Uh, there were individuals that these two individuals were uh, key. The uh, gentleman over on this side here, Red Crow, he is our traditional chief. And he was there when he signed the treaty. The other guy is Crowfoot. He was the chief of the uh, Sitsikai Nation. These two guys were the go-to. Nothing happened unless they were there. All the other chiefs and tribes, they wait for him, wait for especially Red Crow. They waited two weeks. Indian time, hey, just kidding. <laughs> he was down in Montana hunting. And they said, hey, you better get up here, this, this big treaty signing, the queen is here. Ah, she can wait, I'll be there in a little while. <laughs> so he made the whole government of the British government wait for him. So he finally got there and eventually they signed a treaty. And that was in 1877. So they were very instrumental in uh, signing the treaty. These are some, some other chiefs from the other nations there. This is uh, not our current chief, but you might, have, you might have heard his name already, Chief Charlie Weaselhead. I'm sure you guys have heard he's our chancellor over at the university now. He was a chief for quite a while. I worked under him for a while as the liaison in, uh, in uh, on the Blood Reserve. This is our current chief, Chief Roy Fox. Awesome guy, Makiniman. Really good person. Now, as I mentioned, I want to kind of focus on the culture, but I think it's important to kind of give you a, an idea of who we are as people. We're the Blackfoot. And um, I, I respect um, all people, regardless of who you are. We are, you know, we're, we're all at the end of the day human beings, doesn't matter where you come from. We all share the same resources. Our histories might be, our stories on how we arrived to this part of the world are obviously quite different. Now people always ask, well, how long have you been here? Um, we've been here for a long time. And the romantics will tell you that we've been here since time immortal. Well, that sounds really cool to the tourists. But in reality, science, which I worked under uh, some archaeologists at uh, Buffalo Jump, I worked there for six years, and I, I learned the culture through those experts, and I learned the science through those experts, and then I combined the two. And it gives you a pretty good perspective on who we are as a people. So at the Buffalo Jump, there's evidence of hunting there that dates back, uh, I believe it was uh, 9,000 9, years is the oldest artifact that they found, evidence of people hunting. The archaeologists aren't going to say it was you guys. They're just going to say people were here. We like to say, yeah, it was us, <laughs> but we don't know. But when I asked the elders, okay, what's the story? Tell me. And again, they'll say, well, there's this story here that is time immoral. And then there's this here that says we've been here anywhere between five to 10,000 years in this area right here, the ground that we're standing on. Okay, if we've only been here that long, then where did we come from? We came from Las Vegas, Nevada, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Our people came from the Great Lakes area. That is what I've been told. There's people that dispute that. But I'm still doing a lot of research. I, I want to know. I, I, I have to know. So I ask a lot of questions to the old guys. Get, oh, he's coming again. They shut the doors on me. <laughs> but they're the guys who I need to talk to. So I'm, I'm doing research. But that's one of the stories. However, 
The other side, there are stories that are thousands and thousands of years old. There's a rock that we call a buffalo stone, iniskim. The ceremony and the song to that, we have no clue when the origin was. But the stones themselves are millions of years old, okay? So one of our elders uh, always says, you know, they said we uh, came across the, uh, the, uh, the Bering Strait there and came down. The others say that we uh, swung from trees and that as well. You might have swung from trees, but we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a different, you know, depending on who you talk to, there's no one answer. But I always like to look at the oral history of our people and then look at the science and then you can kind of come up with your own idea on the history. So the culture stems from that old oral history. In our culture, we didn't write anything down. Everything we have, we have our ears, our inputs. This is our computer, our database. It's right here. And this is how we send that message out. This is the almighty, most powerful tool you have. I can hit somebody, he might get back up. <laughs> but this could do a lot more damage. What you use this for is sacred. You never use it for bad. You're only good. So the information that we put in when it comes to the culture, the reason we don't write things down is because it's an exercise in learning and retaining that information. In the old days, when an elder teaches you something or gives you information, you're expected to learn it on the first shot. He's going to say, you better be listening because I'm not going to repeat this. And later on in life, you're going to say, I wish I had listened. <laughs> so that's the message. Today, technology has taken that over. Our young people are not listening. They're listening, but not listening to what we're saying. So we talked about language. Language is a good, good, good place to start. When I was growing up, in my grandfather's household, everybody's, their first language was Blackfoot. From the minute they got up to when they went to bed, that was their first language. When somebody tried to speak English, it was kind of funny, you know, we made fun of that person. Ah, it's a biscuit, you know. He's, he's not criticized, but he's kind of teased. And then <clears throat> as time went on, through school, through work, the necessity of just surviving, my, I'll use myself as a, an example. My grandfather died when I was roughly about 14 years old. But he taught me how to work and how to take care of myself. So when he passed on, those skills that he taught me, I used. And I went to work at a very young age. And I always worked off reserve. And I worked amongst a lot of non-native people from my community. My English was decent, but it wasn't perfect. But I had to adapt in order to survive. I need that paycheck. So I, I had to learn English to survive. So I kind of took my language and I kind of put it aside for a while. And I spoke mainly English. So then I had kids. Now my kids don't speak Blackfoot. I only, we, my wife, we only spoke English to them. So they don't know the language. Now we were talking about, oh yeah, they're doing a good job at school, they're teaching our kids. Yeah, they teach them, then you come home and the parents don't know what they're talking about. So we need full immersion. 
And I always use an example of the Hutterite colony on how they preserved their language. Now, I'm not sure if this is true, but I was told by some, some friends of mine that they had, a, they had at least the one in standoff. They have a nursery where all the older ladies who have retired, they're no longer working. The young ladies who just had children would bring these children to the nursery, and the grandmothers would take care of them all day every day, and they only spoke their language to them. English was the second language. They only spoke English when they were ready to start school. So they come out of there with their first language being English. So I challenged the reserve, because they think they need to spend money all the time. There are better ways to do it. We have a nursery. My, my auntie is a hundred, over 100 years old, and every day we're losing these old people. But we have, a, we have a, 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 a home on the reserve where all the elders live right now. And I go in there, and they're watching TV, and they're doing nothing. And we got all these young girls in the city and in the community who are trying to get their kids to speak language, and they're taking them to the school teacher who learned a little bit of Blackfoot. Take them to the source. Take them back, like the Hutterites do. Take them back to the grandmothers and let them teach them. It's going to take about two, three generations to get back to where I was when I was growing up. But there is, we can save the language. And the reason why I'm bringing up the language is because that's the key to the culture. That's the key to the ceremonies. When I do ceremony with the elders, the grandfathers and the grandmothers, every one of those ceremonies are done in our language. They're not done in English, and they're not written, and you can't find them on the internet. The only way is to go to the source, and the source is those grandfathers' database, and your receiver is right here. Shut up and listen. <laughs> Pay attention. Ask questions. That's the only way you're going to return, retain it. Now, culture. What is culture? I'm sad to say, powwow is not culture, okay? Fried bread is not culture. In fact, I encourage people not to eat fried bread. <laughs> the own creator only gave you one heart here, so take care of it. <laughs> eat properly. My grandparents would never eat that. It, a lot of these things were introduced for a good reason. I'll use powwow because it's something that everybody hears and sees and goes to watch. And powwow is a social event, just like you have a dance hall here. You get a band. Let's go have a good time. Socialize. That's what a powwow is. It's not ceremony, OK? Some tribes in Eastern Canada and in the United States have made powwow ceremony because they no longer have ceremony. They've lost their ways. That knowledge is no longer there. Nobody's teaching those generations. So they don't know what to do when it comes to ceremony. So a powwow has taken its place. So you go to a powwow in Manitoba, Somebody drops a feather off their outfit. They shut everything down. They call an elder. They dance over towards it. They make some moves, and then they pick it up, and they give it back. Well, that's fine, but where did they get that from? It originally was a ceremony. We're the only reserve in all of Canada, for North America, for that matter, that still has Akukats. That's Akukats. That, I, to, to, to put it in modern terms, it's, that's our Mecca. That's where all the societies come together, all the clans, all the bundle holders, all the religious artifacts. There's a beautiful picture of what is the Horn Society, which I was a member of, and I'm very proud to have been the leader 
of this group. There's only seven individuals on our reserve who are what I call the modern era of this society. My uncle Adam was the first who repatriated. When he came in, there was only nine bundles. Today, there's 27 bundles. We got our bundles back from private collections. We got them back from museums, from around the world. They're back home with us where they belong. And there's others out there. So the blood tribe, you guys are lucky we're here. <laughs> we're the only tribe who still has a full complement of societies. We have the Horn Society, which is the lead society, the men and women society. We have the Buffalo Women's Motugit Society, all women society. We have the Brave Dog Society, our Crazy Horse Society, Warrior Society, made up of young men and women. They are the policemen. They are the warriors, the protectors. We have the Kakuits, the Pigeon Society, also a younger peer group of warriors. It's a graduation, just like kindergarten to university, OK? We're the only tribe who has that. So what's the difference? The difference is transfer, OK? I need a smoke. <laughs> so somebody dropped, gave this to me, sweet grass, OK? It has an expiration date on it. <laughs> this is very important stuff. So <clears throat> pretend this is the bundle, OK? These bundles go back thousands of years. Who knows what the original owner looked like or who he was? But I can tell you in the Horn Society, they, are, they were warrior societies. And in our language, we don't call it the Horn Society. We call it Ganakats. So all these societies came together, and they used their power and said, we're not going to use this power we've acquired to defend our territories, to war, to kill. We're only going to use it for good now. So they came together, and that's what the bundles have. All of that knowledge, all of that power, all of that strength is in that bundle. Going back thousands of years, who knows how many people had access. The bundle that I have was transferred to me. So now, all of that knowledge, not all of it, I'm still learning, but the bulk of it I've got here. It wasn't written, it was given to me, OK? I had to pay for it. Just like you go to university, you got to pay a tuition. I paid good for that knowledge to that transfer to me. So now, I just transferred it out this past year. I held it for about five, six years. Now I transferred it. That's the difference between what you see on the internet and what you see at powwows, what you see at gatherings, they are just social events. What we have is real. And I call it, it is the true identity of the Blackfoot people. And in this case, the blood tribe, okay? Big, big difference. So when we have a powwow and somebody drops their feather, we don't stop the show. Somebody pick up his feather and tell him to get out of the way. <laughs> Trying to have a good time. There's no ceremony there. However, if one of these guys, during their dance, dropped something, that's when we stop. Hold on. They're going to finish their dance. When the dance is over, some of the older elders are going to come who have the rights, not just anybody from the crowd. It has to be somebody who has been given the right to do that ceremony will come over, pick
pick it up. And then there's an even bigger ceremony that happens after the fact. So all of these things the blood tribe still has today. That's what sets us apart from other First Nations in Canada and the United States. Now, having said that, I'm not being disrespectful to anyone, but a lot of the stuff that you see out there is commercialized. We're not. We don't advertise this. Tourism Lesbridge doesn't know about this. They don't need to know about this because it's nobody's business but ours. And in order to keep it sacred, it has to stay that way. However, again, we have evolved in, a, in this community. The city of Lesbridge, the mayor has been out, some of our MLAs have been out by invitation, but you're welcome to come out, but it's not a tourism event. It's not a, it's not a show. So that's the difference. And later, after lunch, I can, I can maybe explain in a little more, uh, if you have questions regarding that or anything else. But I think for me, that's what culture is. It's sacred. It's not commercialized. It's not fried bread, okay? I love fried bread too, but I don't have it every day. <laughs> so with that, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <clears throat>